Today I am going to talk about uh, transformation induced plasticity. Uh, that means that we induce martensitic transformation by a stress rather than by cooling uh, the steel. Does anyone recognize um, what this bar in the middle of the door might be for? So, if you open up your car door, I do not recommend it, you will find this bar going across it. Do you know what its purpose might be? Protection of like the rubber setting up on the crotch. Yeah, so uh, some years ago there was legislation to say that you must have crash resistance also from side impact as opposed to front impact and that meant actually that uh, the weight of a car, a uh, European car actually increased. It did not decrease over the last 15 years, it is increased because of safety regulations. So, that bar, uh, the purpose of that bar actually is to transmit the forces to the rest of the body. So, that uh, you know if you have a side impact, the whole of the body deforms and absorbs energy and of course, the car is then a write off, but you try and protect the uh, passenger compartment from intrusion from the side. So, the stronger and lighter we can make those components, uh, the better it is for fuel consumption. So, but nevertheless over the last 15 years, the weight of an average car has actually increased not decreased because of safety regulations and that increase would have been even larger had it not been for the sort of steels that I am going to discuss today. And it is not just steels, but uh, transformation induced plasticity uh, also features in some of the best um, cast irons. So, for example, the top uh, slide over there, top right hand slide shows you a suspension arm which is made from cast iron. Okay? Now, you would imagine that cast iron has very little ductility, but because the structure of this particular cast iron contains quite a lot of uh, retained austenite. Uh, it undergoes transformation induced plasticity and that helps to toughen and strengthen the material and similarly this uh, uh, camshaft, uh, both of those are sports cars. So, they undergo quite severe stresses and accelerations and so forth. That camshaft is also made of cast iron which contains quite a lot of retained austenite. Okay? <coughs> When we look at a car door for example, it is not actually made of a single steel. Uh, you know you might want a thicker material uh, towards the bottom of that car door for corrosion protection or you might want different characteristics because the amount of forming that you do in particular region of the door is different. So, what you do is you make actually a <coughs> composite steel, it is called a tailored blank. So, it is a flat piece of steel, but different parts of it have been laser welded together to produce a steel which will give you different properties in different regions of the car door. So, this is an example of a tailored blank which uh, at the back it is a flat piece of steel which has been laser welded together and then it is formed into this complex component without any, uh, any joining together after the forming operation. Okay? So, all the uh, different components of steel are first laser welded together as a flat sheet and then the whole thing is formed. And if you look uh, at um, where this particular component is going, it is going in the mini clubman and that central bit over there. Okay? So, when you look at a car, you know it is not actually a piece of steel. It's, it's got a huge variety of different kinds of steels which serve different functions uh, according to location and requirements. And uh, transformation induced plasticity steels feature a lot in this. Okay, so, why are we interested in these steels? Well, uh, the slide here, uh, the uh, curve here is conventional car body steel say about 20 years ago. And uh, there are two issues there. First, that we have a yield point. Uh, you can see that you have to raise the load first, and then when plasticity sets in, the load decreases. Okay? So, uh, 
what is the disadvantage of having a yield point instead of a smooth onset of plasticity? So you're familiar with 0.2% proof stress, right? When, when we don't see a sharp change, when we go from elastic deformation to plastic deformation, we measure the strength by putting a 0.2% offset. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Okay. So what is the disadvantage of having a sharp yield point when we're talking about forming things? You'll get necking and localized deformation. Exactly. So you get what's known as those uh, Luder's bands, you know, the localized yielding and then the band propagates. That is ugly. Uh, you know, it produces uh, what's known as stretcher strains on the surface of the steel. And the second thing is, of course, uh, you know, you can see that the strength is quite low. It's of the order of 500 megapascals, which means you need to use quite a lot of steel to achieve, uh, achieve the design. Transformation-induced plasticity steels are not only strong initially before the onset of plasticity, but you have a large work hardening capacity. Okay? That is good because when you form the material, it actually gets stronger. Okay? And what is the cause of necking? When you're doing a tensile test, what is the cause of necking? Why doesn't it simply elongate uniformly and then break? What leads to necking in a tensile test? Exactly. So, as you pull, you know, obviously you are reducing the cross-sectional area, but if the material doesn't work harden to compensate for that reduction in cross-sectional area, then it will neck and break. Okay. So, work hardening is an important feature of uh, plastic deformation. You need it in order to prevent premature necking. Okay. Eventually, when the work hardening capacity is exhausted, you will get necking and fracture. Okay. Right. Um, so, going back to transformation induced plasticity, uh, this is a, a particular steel. You can see it's got a, a very large concentration of nickel, which means that it's very stable uh, and the martensite start temperature is minus 80 degrees centigrade. When we do produce martensite, it creates uh, a large deformation on the surface. So you can see uh, both the surface relief and the scratches being deflected, which is a measure of the magnitude of the deformation. So I've emphasized throughout that martensitic transformation is both a physical deformation and uh, a change in crystal structure. What that means is that we must be able to induce it by stress. So if, if I take this particular material uh, at room temperature, which is way above its martin size start temperature, and if I apply a stress, then just like ordinary slip and twinning, once you get to a critical value of the stress, you will induce martin side to form because it's a mechanical driving force as opposed to a chemical driving force when you cool the material. Okay? So the deformation part of martin side means that you can induce it also by stress not simply by undercooling below the MS temperature. Okay? So we'll go into that quantitatively in a bit. Now I want to represent this deformation. And we did some of this uh, at uh, the crystallography C6. So I've got a, uh, an autonormal set of coordinates. Z1 has a magnitude 1, and Z2 is pointing out of the plane of the board, and Z3 is vertical. And we start with uh, a cube of austenite here. And when it transforms, we've got a shear strain and uh, a volume change normal to the habit plane. The habit plane is horizontal here. It's the Z1, Z2 plane. And the typical magnitude of the shear is about 0 0.26 and the volume change 0 0.03. So I want to represent this as a matrix. And I can do that by a 3 by 3 matrix in which the first column will represent what happens to the vector z1 as a consequence of this deformation. z1 has a magnitude 1. 
So what do you expect Z1 to do? Uh, what, what are its new components as a consequence of the deformation? So Z1 is 1, 0, 0. As a consequence of deformation, does it acquire any different components? It doesn't, because it's lying in the habit plane. So it'll be 1, 0, 0. Similarly, Z2 will be 0, 1, 0, because it's also in the habit plane. Yeah. What about Z3? What does Z3 become? So it's, it's obviously tilted and extended, isn't it? So what are its components along Z1? What are the components of this vector here along Z1? S. S. And along Z2, which is out of the plane of the board, is uh, it's still 0. And Z3? OK, so we're looking at this vector. One plus zeta, zeta, yeah. Okay, so that that is our deformation matrix, uh, where the first column represents the components of uh, a vector parallel to Z1, uh, as a consequence of deformation. Z2 as a consequence of deformation, and Z3 as a consequence of deformation. So if I now multiply this matrix by a column vector representing any particular vector, then I know what will happen to it as a consequence of the deformation. Yeah, everyone happy with that? <coughs> so just as an example, um, I'm using square brackets here to write a column vector. Okay. So if I take my uh, matrix Z, multiply it by uh, a vector 1, 0, 1, where U is 1, 0, 1, then I will get my vector V as 1 plus S, because we've got a column vector on the right, 1, times 1 plus 0 times 0 plus s times 1 will be 1 plus s. And then uh, 0 along uh, z2 and zeta um, for the third component, 1, 0, 1 times um, that. Okay. So the vector 101 becomes 1 1.260, 1.03 as a consequence of this deformation. Is everyone happy with that? Now notice that in general, uh, we expect vectors to be rotated and distorted, right? So in, in the diagram that I've drawn there, V is not necessarily parallel to U. It's only along the principal axes that the vector is unrotated, right? So I'm going to ignore that rotation at the moment, but if you wanted to work out the tensile deformation along U approximately, then I just take the magnitude of V divided by the magnitude of U, and I've got the extension roughly along U. You, you would need to, if there is a rotation, you simply need to resolve it along U. Okay. So in this particular case, if I take uh, effectively the strain, that is 1 minus the magnitude of U over the magnitude of U, then I get a 14% extension along there as a consequence of Martin Siddick transformation, the vector 101 becomes extended by 14%. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? Now, of course, when I apply a stress, uh, I've got many possible orientations of Martin side, right? So let's say the habit plane is 3, 10, 15, then I can form 24 different variants of 3, 10, 15, right? It could be 15, 3, 10, etc., etc. Yeah? Everyone happy with that? So just like we have a slip system where you know you get slip on a closed back plane and in a closed back direction, you should regard Martin's height as a deformation in which the habit plane is the deformation plane and the displacement direction is the slip, effectively the slip direction. Okay? So there are 24 possibilities. So how can I work out which which plate of martensite will actually form, or, or rather, which variant of martensite will actually form when I apply stress? Yeah. So think about how you work out uh, which is the favored slip system. Which has the highest resolved stress on it. Yeah, very good. So it's ba basically the one which will have the highest resolved uh, 
stress, uh, shear stress, but it's a little bit more complicated because we also have a volume change. Okay, so we need to take account of that. <coughs> okay, so uh, first of all, just to remind you, uh, this is how we calculate the Martin's eye start temperature. You've got a free energy curve for austenite and a free energy curve for ferrite. The point where they cross is your T0 temperature. And we need to undercool below T0 in order to find the Martin's eye start temperature because why do we need to undergo below T0? Sorry? Yeah, you've got all the stored energy of Martin side in terms of elastic strains, in terms of uh, you know, twin interfaces created, and so forth. So there's a critical value of the driving force at which Martin side is triggered. And then we can calculate the Martin side start temperature. Now, stress will modify this, all right? Because you're adding a mechanical driving force. How do I calculate a mechanical driving force? So remember, uh, you know, when we were working out elastic strain energy, it was the area under the stress-strain curve. So it was stress times strain uh, divided by 2 because it was a triangle, right? How in this case would I work out the interaction between the stress and the deformation? So I want to add a mechanical driving force here. So you should just take away from the activation energy from our transformation, you should take away the strain energy stored in the zero. Uh, so that doesn't disappear. Yeah, th that will still be there. Yeah, yeah. You subtract that. So it gets smaller because Yeah, yeah. But how much do I depending on how much strain you release by the formation of Martin side? Right, right. Um, so that's, that's the real question I'm asking. How do I calculate that? So, you know, if you have a stress and you have a strain, then what's the energy? Stress times strain. Stress times strain. So in the case of Martin's side, what is the stress and what is the strain that I need to multiply? So, so the stress is what you said earlier, which is the resolved shear stress. What do I multiply that by? So shear, strain shear strain. And do I divide by 2 or not? When we, when we were plotting Hooke's law, it was, it was the area under the triangle. Is this an elastic strain? It's not. It's a plastic strain, isn't it? Therefore, uh, it's just stress times strain. And what about the um, normal stress on the habit plane? I multiply it by zeta, the volume change. Okay, is everyone happy with that? So, uh, in order to calculate this, I'll go into the calculation of the mechanical driving force. Uh, what I've uh, done is I've added that to the chemical driving force. It's all negative, all right? Yeah, delta G is negative, and the stress also adds to that chemical driving force. And the effect of that mechanical driving force uh, is that I make Martin-Siddick transformation possible at a higher temperature than is possible simply by cooling. Yeah? So you've, you've made the austenite less stable by applying a stress. And therefore, you trigger martin Siddick transformation even though you are above the normal martin side start temperature. Just like causing physical deformation by applying a stress. Okay? Now, the temperature that I've plotted here, ms sigma, if I, if I go beyond that temperature, I can't trigger martin side because even this curve comes above the critical value that I ne require for martin Siddick transformation. So that is the highest temperature at which a stress can stimulate martin Siddick transformation. Okay? If I go beyond that, austenite might deform plastically, but it's not going to transform. Everyone happy with that? So when applying more stress, increase the value of U and hence push yes. sigma further. Yeah, so this is for uh, uh, 
Yes, you are right. You are right. So if I apply a greater stress, u will become larger. Uh, you will get to a point where if I apply too large a stress, then the austenite simply yields and then you are not increasing the stress. Okay. okay? Yeah. yeah. But that is not illustrated on the diagram. You are right. Everyone happy with that? Now, just to show you uh, that this is, uh, this is the case, I am going to illustrate uh, a very simple experiment in which in a single experiment, I have the amount of mite inside that forms as a function of stress. So, instead of taking a tensile specimen which is parallel sided, if we make it tapered, then when you break it, you have got a gradient of stress, right? So, here is uh, an experiment where we have a tapered tensile specimen <coughs> and you can see that the amount of martensite increases as the stress increases. Okay? So, this is actually being tested at room temperature which is above its normal martensite start temperature which is minus 44 degrees centigrade. So when I pull and I break, I have got in a single experiment a whole range of values of stress and when I look at the microstructure at uh, let us say a particular location, you can see martensite plates triggered, the, the uh, stress axis is horizontal. Now, can you see anything peculiar about the microstructure? Are the plates forming at random, in random orientations? They are not, are they? So, what sort of angle would you guess there would be between the plate and the stress? 45 degrees, right? Because it is the plane of maximum shear stress. Uh, we have a slight complication that we also have a volume change. So, it would not be exactly 45, we will we'll go into that shortly. Um, but it is quite amazing that this is a polycrystalline sample and yet all the grains are choosing to form martensite on a plane which is roughly the plane of the maximum shear stress. So, we have actually made the microstructure non-random by inducing those plates which comply with the stress. Right? So, when these plates form there, if you are applying a tensile stress, that would, they would lead to elongation along the tensile direction. That means, they are complying with the stress. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so, um, I have got a tensile stress and I want to work out which orientation of martensite is going to be favoured by that tensile stress and I want to resolve that stress into a shear stress and a normal stress on the habit plane. Okay? Uh, now, you can do this using uh, uh, you know, a stress tensor or simply using a Mohr circle. Yeah? You are familiar with the Mohr circle, right? So, uh, you apply a, a tensile stress sigma 1 and that sigma 1 can be resolved. Uh, so, supposing that the martensite plate is making an angle theta with respect to the uh, tensile stress, then we can resolve uh, the we, we can resolve sigma 1 into a stress which is normal to the habit plane and parallel to the habit plane. Yeah. Is everyone happy with this construction? So, um, what will the shear stress be just by looking at the geometry? So, remember the radius of the circle is sigma 1 upon 2. If I take sine of 2 theta times sigma 1 upon 2, that gives me um, the shear stress, right? And the normal stress. Yeah, it's the it's the the horizontal distance here, so that's the normal stress and that's the shear stress, and in order to work out u, I simply have to multiply each of those by the respective shear strains and normal strain, right? 
sorry. Um, so sigma one. Yeah. On the horizontal axis, so wouldn't our shear stress just be zero? No, no. Uh, in the Mohr circle, you are plotting. Uh, so, so the habit plane is at an angle theta to the tensile axis, yes. and on the Mohr circle, you plot the shear stress as a function of orientation. So it's it's not zero if the plate is inclined at theta. If theta is zero, then the shear stress is zero. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. 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 It's simply the Mohr circle construction. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, we get our interaction energy U as the shear stress times the shear strain plus the normal stress times the normal strain. However, I still don't know which plate of martensite will be most favored, so I differentiate u with respect to theta to find the maximum, and uh, the maximum interaction will occur when tangent, uh, so I take the differential, set that to zero, and you find that the maximum interaction is when uh, the angle uh, tangent of two theta is equal to the shear strain divided by the normal strain. Okay, so that's the one that will tend to be favored most, have the largest value of u. Everyone happy with that? Yep. Why do you need the S? Uh, the shear st uh, strain. So it's the shear stress multiplied by the shear strain gives you an energy. Okay, and similarly, the normal stress multiplied by the normal strain gives you the interaction energy. Yeah. Uh, so, because it's plastic deformation, you can think about the stress strain curve being flat and you're looking at the area under that stress strain curve. Yeah. And this will come out uh, for typical values of S and zeta, it will come out as about 46, 47 degrees. Okay, um, so I'm now um, looking at elongation caused by a plate which forms at the optimum orientation. All right. So if, if you take your austenitic sample and it transforms completely into a plate which is optimally oriented, then what is the elongation I can get? So I want to work out the maximum elongation possible due to transformation induced plasticity. And we use exactly the same procedure from the 10 to theta equals s over zeta. Uh, the angle is 46 degrees. So I've applied my tensile stress at theta max. Right? And the components of that tensile axis uh, are given by sine theta max, zero and cos theta max. Okay, so it's oriented like that. So you just take its components along z1, z2, and z3. And that's the component of the tensile axis. When I plug it into my deformation matrix, I get what happens to it as a consequence of the transformation. And therefore, I work out that the maximum possible elongation that I can get is 15%. If the entire austenite in your steel 100% austenite transforms into the most favored variant of martensite. Okay. There's also another assumption here that you know the habit plane can vary freely. Okay, so theta max may not actually coincide with 3, 10, 15, right? But we'll ignore that. This is just giving you the maximum possible strain that we could get if 100% of austenite transforms into martensite of the optimum orientation. Okay? Everyone happy with that? So just imagine, you know, you can get 15% elongation simply by phase transformation. Yeah. <coughs> and 15% is a lot of elongation. Okay? Yeah? Exactly. Exactly. So, so I'm going to go on to why that uh, is not reasonable, but 
you know, it is amazing that you can get 15% elongation if you could achieve 100% uh, transformation into the optimal orientation. If you can't, it'll be less than that. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, there's there's another much more serious problem, is that in the context of steels, we cannot afford to use 30% of nickel. Yeah. To make the material completely austenitic at room temperature. Uh, if you if you look at carbon nanotubes, you know expense doesn't seem to matter at all. Yeah? But when we are making large engineering components, 30% of nickel is just too expensive. Right? So we cannot, uh, there, there you won't find uh, commercially available trip steels which contain that sort of a concentration and which are fully osmotic. What is the cheapest element for stabilizing austenite? Manganese, uh, again, you know, we would have to add large concentrations. So it's, it's possible. Manganese is quite cheap. It is possible. And I will go on to talk about another class of steels, which, is, uh, which are known as TWIP, T-W-I-P, twinning induced plasticity, which contain large concentration of manganese. But a much cheaper, you know, you actually remove excess of this element when you make steel. Sorry. Hmm? Carbon. carbon, that's right. So I could add lots of carbon and stabilize the austenite, right? But remember, we want to make uh, cars. So we've got to, what is the joining process that you use when making cars? Yeah, and what kind of welding? Spot welding. So that involves a very uh, powerful spike of uh, current, which heats it up and cools it rapidly. So if I have a lot of carbon in my steel, then there's going to be a problem because you'll form brittle, untempered martensite, right? So, so we are limited in the amount of carbon that we can use. So how can we produce a cheap trip steel? <coughs> so trip steels which are fully austenitic are expensive. So how can we produce cheap austenite, uh, which still allows our material to be valuable, etc., etc. There's a whole bank of properties that you need to consider. Well, we, we already looked into this yeah, when we uh, discussed the design of bainitic steels. Uh, even if your average carbon concentration is low, when bainite forms, it partitions carbon into the austenite and enriches that austenite to make it stable. Yeah? And in order to maintain that enrichment, we've got to kill the cementite. Right? Uh, and I explained to you that there's a few elements which retard the precipitation of cementite because they simply do not like being in the cementite lattice. And silicon was one of them, aluminum is another. So uh, if I do first principles calculations, uh, I can't do experimental measurements of uh, what silicon does in cementite because the solubility is virtually zero. Okay? So if I do first principles calculations and substitute an iron atom with a silicon atom, I get a massive increase in the energy of the cementite. Okay? Uh, so it's a very effective element for preventing the precipitation of cementite and we cut off the bainite reaction at this point. Okay? So we're left with bainitic ferrite plates and carbon enriched austenite. So it's uh, incredible, you know, if you are maintaining the average carbon concentration of the steel low because we need to be able to spot weld it and so forth. Uh, so typically this would have a carbon concentration of 0.28%. But because of the partitioning of carbon, the austenite, the remaining austenite would end up with something like 1.28% carbon, which would make it stable at room temperature. Okay. Of course, we are not going to get 100% austenite, but we still get a substantial amount of austenite. So these are called trip-assisted steels. They're not 100% austenite, but they're assisted by the trip phenomenon. 
and you produce them by uh, two, two methods. Uh, one is you make the material fully austenitic, then you form about 70% of allotriomorphic ferrite, so that's also partitioning carbon. And the remaining 30% of the austenite will then transform into a mixture of bainite and carbon enriched austenite. Right? Or you simply heat the material into the two phase field, so you've got your 70% of allotriomorphic ferrite and then transform into uh, the rest of the austenite into bainite. So this is what the structure looks like. Uh, we've got quite a lot of allotriomorphic ferrite, about 70% of the structure. And the rest of it is a mixture of bainitic ferrite plates and carbon enriched austenite. So if you look at this high magnification, this is the bainite and this is the austenite, which is now rich in carbon. <coughs> so uh, if you look at the chemical composition at the top, we've only got 0.15 weight percent of carbon. And the critical thing is 1.5 weight percent of silicon. Okay? It's that silicon is absolutely essential to prevent cementite precipitation. So this is what the microstructure of a trip-assisted steel would look like. Okay, so let's, let's do a calculation. Um, the phase fractions are 70% of allotriomorphic ferrite, and we have some bainite and some martensite, approximately uh, some austenite. So we've got 70% allotriomorphic ferrite, 15% of bainitic ferrite, and 15% of austenite. Only 15%, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, you know, the earlier calculation that we did where we worked out what happens when 100% of austenite transforms into the most favored variant of martensite, we had 15% elongation. Can you take a guess of how much that elongation would be reduced when we only have 0.15 volume fraction of austenite? Yeah, because it's 15 times 0.15, okay? The maximum uh, from the austenite has to be scaled by the volume fraction of austenite. Okay. So, typical uh, structure here, 70% of allotriomorphic ferrite, bainitic ferrite and some retained austenite. This was the elongation we got with 100% of austenite, but I need now to, uh, to scale that by the volume fraction of austenite, so that gives me about 2.1 um, uh, elongation, okay? So 2.1% elongation due to trip. Now, one of the first slides I showed you, it had far greater than 2.1% elongation, okay? So th this is negligible, really. So how is transformation-induced plasticity actually giving us a high elongation? It's not from the strain caused by phase transformation because that's just too small. Okay? So uh, let me just go back to, well, if I go back, there's a lot of slides to go through, but do you remember that the trip steel had something like 25% elongation, all right? So how come it has so much elongation? That, that's the key. So the work hardening capacity is increased. Now why is the work hardening capacity increased? So I'm pulling, yeah, and the austenite is transforming into very hard martensite, right? Uh, because, you know, the carbon concentration of the austenite is about 1.2 weight percent. That is making the material harder. And if the austenite transforms gradually, then elongation continues because of the work hardening until all of the austenite is exhausted. Okay? So the transformation plasticity, yes, it plays a role. But the much more important thing is that by transforming the austenite, you are creating hardening. Okay? And this, this simple 
theory which proves that the transformation plasticity itself has a small role was just a very short paper. Uh, until then people r thought that basically it was the strain due to transformation that is causing this enormous elongation. And the second point is that if the austenite transforms suddenly, all of it transforms suddenly, that is not helpful. Yeah? It should transform gradually as we pull the material. Is everyone happy with that? Okay. Now, I am going to uh, sort of finish the lecture by pointing out, um, oh sorry, I have this uh, slide in the next slide which shows, you know, the elongation of the trip steel is 25 percent, yeah, whereas uh, transformation plasticity is only adding 2.1 percent. But you can see the slope of that curve indicating that there is an awful lot of work hardening, right? And that work hardening is because we are creating hard martensite in this structure, work hardening. Okay. So, elongation of trip uh, assisted steel is not uh, really due to transformation plasticity, but because of the formation of hard martensite. Okay. Now, there is a problem with these steels and that is the silicon. So, when you are manufacturing the steel, uh, you it is hot rolled. Okay? So, you will get oxidation on the surface and uh, obviously, the oxygen concentration is highest at the top. So, we get a gradient of um, oxides. This is iron oxide Fe 3 or 4 and Fe 2 or 3. But with silicon, you also get this uh, low melting point oxide which is called phaolite, iron silicon oxide. And because it has a low melting temperature, it, it penetrates the surface of the steel and mechanically keys to the steel. So, when you remove the scale by high pressure water jets, etcetera, during the process end of the process, some iron oxide FeO is left on the surface here. And over time, it oxidizes to Fe2 or 3, which is red in color. Okay? Now, that Fe203 actually looks quite beautiful. So, you know, if you, if you look at these structures, uh, at this particular photograph I took in uh, Colorado uh, in a national park where they do not want to paint the steel. But if you alloy the steel so that you get a uniform layer of this red oxide, then you do not need to paint the steel. Okay? So, all over the national park, you find this beautiful colored steel which is not painted, but it has created Fe203 on the surface. That is fine all right, for that sort of an application, but the last thing we want on a car body steel is something like this because the oxide could not be removed properly before you go on to the other treatments which protect the steel against corrosion. That is ugly all right, and not tolerable on uh, external surfaces which are going to be painted to look perfect. You know the technology of painting cars is incredible, there is something like seven different layers involved and this changes the adhesion of the galvanic coatings etcetera, so it is not acceptable. So, we have got to redesign this steel to avoid this red oxide problem for cases where you know it is a customer facing component. Okay? So, we will talk about that in the next lecture. <coughs>